Arthur, thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Thank you for the opportunity of coming back to Budapest and to adding yet another sports arena to my impressive list or, that I have already. Now, so far this morning and throughout the next two days, you're going to hear a lot from my peers talking about threats, talking about, oh, hackers, talking about a number of things that are intended to scare the hell out of you. And that's not a bad thing from the security perspective. I want to take a slightly different perspective on this. I want to look back over the last couple of years and try to figure out why are we in this situation that we're, we're in today. So, if we take a look at the list, a couple of purposes. There should be some names on here that you recognize. Some have already been mentioned. Two purposes for using this, this illustration. One is just the sheer size of it. Large companies, small companies, some, and I'm a security professional, I've never heard about. Domino's Pizza? Really? I live in France. I didn't even know we had Domino's in France. I guess if you were afraid that your preference for pineapple on pizza is something you don't want other people to find out, that's one that you should be worried about. But there's really two companies on the list that to me define the situation that we're dealing with today. The first one, of course, is Target. Now, Target is approaching two years old now, and for me, it's what changed everything. Before the Target data breach, think back to Aurora at Google, major company. Nobody knew about it outside of the industry. But Target, Target changed everything. Here was a company that if you live in America, you either shop at or you know somebody that shops there. The data breach happened in the run-up to the Christmas buying season. So it was affecting everybody. Because of all of those issues, the coverage of the data breach wasn't restricted to trade press or maybe a 30-second mention on CNN. Your local newspapers were covering it as front-page news. Target's been hacked. Your neighbors were talking about it. And even your grandmother, who probably still can't figure out how to send an email, she was talking about it. So that was a major, what I'll call a seminal change. It, was ha uh, it changed the way the general population perceived these data breaches. It was no longer an industry issue. It was a general purpose issue. The other one is Home Depot. And now the statistics say that Home Depot, and for those of you not familiar with it, very large uh, hardware store chain in North America, 56 million credit card numbers were stolen. 55 million, 999,999, it doesn't matter. The one that does matter was mine. I happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time last summer, doing some work for my sister, went to Home Depot, bought some stuff, gone. That was in July of last year. In October, between Friday night and Saturday morning, I received a text and emails from American Express. When I finally reached out to them, they told me somebody had tried to charge $9,000 of Apple equipment on my American Express card. Well, first of all, if anybody that knows me knows I'm the last person in the world that would buy anything from Apple. A, I still use a Blackberry, and B, to me, they're the de de devil spawn Apple. So, obviously, my credit card put two and two together. My credit card had been compromised and sold about three months later. Fortunately for me, my first line of defense worked. The anti-fraud software in American Express. It, of course, it disallowed the charge, issued a new card, and I've not had any repercussions since then. But what about the people who used credit cards that didn't have that same level of protection? or what is very popular in America, to use cash cards, payment cards, that do not have the same level of protection as a credit card does, consumer protection. These are the victims in that. I was very lucky. I didn't have to deal with it. So, 
Those were a couple of years ago. Have we learned our lessons? Who's heard of this one, Carbonek? Or this one, the dire wolf? These are from earlier this year, and I'll go into a little bit of detail with them. But it's clear the statistics, we are not learning our lessons. Companies are not launching extensive examinations, internal examinations of what's going on in their network. So if these are still happening, the question is why? Well, if we look at what is commonly thought to be the architecture of an advanced persistent thread, it was touched on slightly during the FBI's presentation this morning, I can look at and see there are, it's a very complex environment. And in fact, it's very similar to product development. What am I going to do? Who is my target? What is the functionality? What is, my, what is it intended to do? And if I look again, there are two areas in particular that I find very interesting. The first one is social engineering. And as the FBI director said, it's amazing what you can get off of social networks, websites, names, email formats, contact information, even calling into companies and saying you're a user that's lost your password. Now that, might, that may not work as well as it once did, but it's certainly a valid way to get information from the network. Now the other one that I really struggle with, because if we've got all this technology and we know all there is to know about malware, how does this initial intrusion happen? How do they get in? I'd like to be able to say it's they're smarter than us. I'd like to be able to say the malware changes at such a rate we can't keep up with it. And all of that is true. However, it's not malware that's the leading cause of these data breaches. It's Dave. And I apologize to any Daves in the audience. Human error is the thing that we fight against most often. And it's the thing that we have the least offense against. We can put as much technology into a network but we can't compete or we can't stop Dave from clicking that email that says, you've won a million dollars. So I'm gonna leave Dave there in the corner for a minute and go back to some of these data breaches. Target. Now, we normally make an association between these data breaches and advanced persistent threats. Target was not. Target was an unhappy alliance of coincidences that ultimately led to the data breach. A particularly uninventive hacker sending out a phishing email, a poor technician at an air conditioning company, company who was using a free sample of some anti-malware software on their network, clicks on the email. Okay, somebody fell for a phishing email. He then goes into that particular company's network and discovers he can get into Target. This wasn't thought out in advance, it was pure coincidence. And then once he gets in the target, he finds out the network is completely open and he can go anywhere he wants. Now eventually he gets to the point of sale information with all the names, addresses and credit card numbers, starts or needs to get it out of the network. So he implants malware into the network. Not brand new malware, not particularly clever malware. In fact, two of the security systems at Target detected the malware in the network, the antivirus and their sandboxing system. Both alarms were ignored, either not appreciated or just lost in the general hubbub of, a day, of every day in the network. From there, all of that information was brought out. Now, it's not an isolated incident. That attack started from a third party. We've seen the same thing in the Home Depot attack. It wasn't an attack on Home Depot's network itself, but rather through one of their contractors. But again, they fell into the same, they fell into the same trap at, at Target. No security between the external entity and the network itself. J.P. Morgan Chase. Here was a case where one web application, starting with Stolen credentials, again, stolen login credentials, and they did not use two-factor authentication in that specific application, where they did use it in other places, that led to the data breach. 
So malware, yes, it's certainly involved, but it's that Dave factor that we struggle to deal with. Go back to the Carbonac from earlier this year. A billion dollars. And what was interesting about this, it wasn't addressed to the banking users. It wasn't trying to put malware on hundreds of thousands of PCs. It was attacking the bank itself. And then once they were into the bank, they were able to either execute fraudulent bank transfers or even at a predetermined place and time, have an ATM start spitting out money. Wouldn't you have loved to have been standing in the line, the guy behind that, and all of a sudden $100,000 comes out? But how did it begin? It began with a phishing email and compromised login, login credentials. There is definitely a trend here that continues. The direwolf, similar structure, attacking the bank itself, but this was bank-to-bank -bank transfers. Had a very, very sophisticated social engineering aspect to it because the hackers had to pose as help desk for a, for a website that was no longer working. But how did it start? Malware being brought in through a phishing attack. Now, another interesting aspect from a security perspective here is that once the attack was over, they launched a DDoS attack to cover their tracks. And this is a technique we're seeing more and more. Launch a DDoS attack, divert attention away from what you've just done, let people go chasing something else. So if we go back to our advanced persistent threat framework, I can roughly divide the circle in half and say, technology helps me on this side, but that technology can only work if it's backed up by best practice and network architecture at the company itself. But the vulnerability still exists on the other side. And I'm going to come back to that vulnerability bit. I want to look at the technology. Now, you have probably have seen this idea, this concept, in a number of different ways from a number of different vendors. And it describes a framework, rather than just focusing on one aspect of your network defense. You should be looking at it as three complementary pieces. And the first one is one that we've been dealing with for years, this idea of prevention. And all of these technologies, beginning with a firewall, antivirus, or two-factor authentication, which considering the involvement of human error, two-factor authentication should be deployed everywhere in your network. Now, none of those technologies should be a surprise to anybody in this room, with the exception of one, antivirus. Because we've been told for years, antivirus is dead. Why bother with it? And when you look at this recent article, if you read just the headline, that's the impression you would come away with. In fact, if you did read the article, the author is making the exact same point that I am, that antivirus by itself will not defend your network. But as part of a multi-layer, multi-element defensive scheme, it has a role to play. And you've, I mean, the title today, Battling the Unknowns, well, the malware used against your network is made up of both known malware and unknown malware. An antivirus, along with all of those prevention technologies, are designed to fight the known malware. So why not use it? If it works, it's a well-known entity, continue to use it, but don't rely on it by itself. So what do we have to do before we said, oh, we'll put all these technologies in, we'll put in boxes, and that'll protect me. Well, that's proven not to be the case because of the malware, because of the creativity of the people behind the malware. So what we have to do is bring in another layer, a detection layer. So, so for that piece of malware that we've never seen before, makes it through the network, I can now detect it. Now, the best known technology there is sandboxing. Over the last couple of years, Sandboxing has received a lot of attention. And it's a good technology. You should be looking at it. But it's not going to end everything. It's not going to solve all your problems. I mean, the hackers are not stupid people. They're not going to, oh, there's a sandbox in the network. I'm going to quit. I give up. No. They know how sandboxes work. And they're going to develop malware that counters the technology within a sandbox. 
So you look at other technologies as well. Technologies that could be part of your prevent layer but have a detection function. But regardless, the objective here is to block as much as we can from getting into the network and have my detect technologies detect a piece of malware that's made it through as quickly as possible. And as soon as that detection has taken place, people, process, other technologies come into play. Where did, where did the incursion occur? How widespread is it? What systems are infected? How do I contain it? But then there's another element of this as well. If that malware made it through your network, and assuming it's not human error, that we take the assumption that that malware has never been seen before, or that variation is unknown to the systems. Well, that malware that you've now detected, that should be sent off to some off-site facility maintained by your vendor for further analysis, confirmation, and ultimately brought back into the network in the form of an update. So all of those systems can be updated so that the next time that piece of malware arrives in the network, and it will, you now know about it and you can block it from getting in again. It's only when you have all three layers working in a coordinated fashion will this particular defense work. So from a Fortinet perspective, how do we do it? And you can see we have a very complicated naming scheme in our product lines. Anything we have is a 40 something or other. But if I look at, if I look at some of the common attack vectors, the wide area network. So I'll put a firewall there, 40 gate. My email systems, I'll put a secure gateway, 40 mail. And my websites, 40 web, web application firewall. And on my endpoints, I will put client software on each one of those desktops. Now, obviously I'm using Fortinet products here, but you could be doing this with anybody's products. The problem is there are gaps. Each unit, each point product is very good at what it's designed to do, but malware has too many opportunities, opportunities to slip through them. So these gaps between the systems, between the technologies, need to be closed off. Again, from a Fortinet perspective, how do we start to do this? The first thing we do is we deploy antivirus everywhere in the network. It's a complementary function to the base level functionality of those products. But by deploying across the network the same capability, we're starting to tie things together. We're starting to close off those gaps. And to close it off faster, that threat research and development that I alluded to in the previous slide, within Fortinet, that's what's called FortiGuard. And that's our team of researchers, of engineers, who are taking real-time threat information from our units installed around the world, millions of units, bringing it in, combining that with zero-day research and other research that they do, the output of which is continuous updates to all of those different systems. The goal, again, tying these pieces tighter together and eliminating those gaps. And another piece that we add to the puzzle is sandboxing. Yes, as I said, sandboxing is a good technology and you should look at it, but not rely 100% on it. But all of those other systems, what we've done, we're filtering data that's coming into the network. So the amount of work the sandbox has to do is reduced to minutes from hours. And it can detect a new piece of malware, one or two minutes reducing the window of opportunity that, that the hacker has to cause damage in your network. Regardless of fancy technology, all the different boxes here, I'm still talking about the perimeter of the network. What about when something does get inside of the network? Well, enterprise networks, the analogy I like to make is kind of the way a uh, polar bear thinks of an igloo. It's crunchy on the outside and soft and chewy on the inside. So how do we prevent that? How do we look inside the network at the same time we're looking at the outside? Now, from a networking perspective, we've done segmentation for years, beginning with bridges 
into routers, then switches, VLANs. All of this has been done to ease the networking as our local area networks have grown. But they do nothing if a piece of malware gets in. And one of the characteristics of a piece of malware it used in these attacks is to move around the network. The point it gets in, its initial intrusion, is not necessarily, it's very rarely where it wants to be. So it's going to go ahead and start looking for the network to find its target destination. So where it entered building nine, let's say that's finance, and building 48, that's the, that's the R&D development center. Now, in this scenario, I can't stop that from happening. So an idea that's being promoted and something for you to think about is how do you deploy firewalls inside of the network? Using them, not replacing your switches, but placing them in strategic areas for increased segmentation and segmentation as close as possible to the users and the applications. So now, when that malware tries to move, because we've tied identity to policy, I can easily set up a policy that says, hey, nobody on the, VLAN, on the finance VLAN has the right to go into the R&D VLAN, so block that traffic, whether it's legitimate traffic or malware. So this idea of internal segmentation is something that's getting a lot of, a lot of thought right now. And as I said, this is not a new product. This is just deploying firewalls that you already know and love inside of your network. So technology, it's great stuff. I work in a technology business. It keeps me going well. But does it solve all the problems? No. Here's an email, a spam email that I got earlier this year. And for me, it was quite easy to detect that it was a spam. Primarily because I've never had a bank account at NatWest. But I figured, hey, I work for a security company. I have all sorts of technology on my laptop. Let me click on the link. Well, in this case, it was so bad, or I should say the website behind that link is so old and so well known into the hacker world that even my web browser was able to stop it. So first line of defense working again. And I'm sure you get all of these, all of you get emails like these on a daily basis. But what about one like this? This is a copy of a real phishing email that was sent out from allegedly the IRS, the tax authorities in the United States, to small business owners. And I'm sure you're all getting some of these mails now that make you think twice. You can't automatically say, oh, it's spam. So that's the problem we have with Dave. He's always been our weak link, and the efforts to get past him are getting stronger all the time. So what do we do? Awareness. It's not technology, it's training. Conducting your own spamming attacks to raise the awareness of your employees. Accompanied by a process that people can turn to and say, hey, I might have made a mistake. Not punitive, they don't have to worry about retribution, but rather informing the company. So you're starting to equip one of your lines of defense of giving them the tool to say something bad might have, might have happened. Uh, I was in London last week speaking at an event, and a gentleman from the Bank of England was asking about this. They implemented these internal phishing attacks. And over time, what they saw wasn't so much a change in the percentage of people who clicked the link, but rather in the reporting. From the first time they did it to a subsequent time, what they saw were people, now that they were aware of it, aware they made a mistake and reporting it much faster. And that's what you want, is you want notification that there's a phishing email like this into, in your network. Is this the end of data breaches? Are we done? Is technology solving all of our problems? Again, I'd like to say yes, but it's not the case. Now, even though I live in France, I have the privilege of paying taxes both there and to the United States. So I have a very intimate relationship with these people. And in May, they announced that they had had a data breach. And how it started, or the data breach itself, was there was a particular web application you could go to 
And by supplying information about yourself, you could get information from the previous year's tax return. Now, in the United States, there are valid reasons for asking for your declaration for previous years. And what was happening is that with the stolen information, people would log into the website. And here, what we had was a multi-step authentication process. Multi-step in, oh, I've not seen you on this computer before. What's your address? What's your date of birth, your social security number? And once they were able to complete that, they were then able to get the information illegally that they were trying to obtain. Now, how bad was the problem? Well, originally they said 200,000 attempts with 100,000 records being stolen. So, sometimes you got through because you had the right answers to the question, sometimes you didn't. In actuality, they later said the problem was three times as bad. 600,000 attempts with 300,000 records stolen. Now, with that information, you could file a fraudulent claim and either get tax refunds that were due to somebody else or just come up with a reason that you were able to claim additional tax refund from the government. So how big was the problem? $50 million in three months. Pretty significant, you say. But a drop in the bucket compared to the overall problem that the IRS deals with. $5.3 billion of tax fraud in 2013. Now, this by itself, you say, okay, but what is really worrying here is how it all started. Stolen personal data. Data probably coming from the Target, the Home Depot, and all the other data breaches that's been bought and sold on the internet is now being used for another data breach all by itself. Now, how could the IRS have dealt with this? Not with multi-step authentication, but multi-factor authentication. Using a token, sending a text to a predefined telephone number or a code to a predefined email address. The FBI director mentioned the Office of Personnel Management. It wasn't a particularly good summer for the United States government. Now, this is essentially the human resource department for the U.S. government. And they necessarily weren't hacked, but it was two of the agencies that they use, two contractors, I should say, that they use, that were hacked, that led into this particular breach. And I love this quote here, compromised login, login credentials being used in 80% of the data breaches that this particular company, this particular gentleman has seen. Target, as I already mentioned, Anthem is one of the contractors that was hacked initially leading to the OPM hack. Now, this one you may not be aware of. Uh, this one was fairly, fairly recent. Those three companies are news wires. Companies like Fortinet, public companies, we, want to, we need to announce information about the company. It could be financial results, it could be people leaving, people hiring, whatever the case may be. And the key point is that information is gathered and prepared beforehand, sent to these different wire services, and then at the predetermined time is released to the rest of the world simultaneously. And that's the key point. Everybody has to get the information at the same time. Well, what was happening, it was a group of hackers working with a group of stockbrokers. These companies apparently had been hacked for a number of years, and the brokers were saying, get me the information on company X, Y, and Z, financial information primarily, and based on whether it was good news or bad news, they would make trades accordingly. $100 million of insider trading going on over several years. Just discovered this summer, stolen employee identities, spear phishing attacks, booby track links. The trend continues. And technology can only deal with it to a certain extent. The enterprise has to take ownership of the pieces of it, as I was saying, raising the awareness about these phishing attacks. After that, you can deal with the, the, the malware, deal with the technology but you've got to close off that weak link. Now, there's one breach here that I'm not using because I don't know all the details about it, but it's a very famous breach happened in the last couple of months. 
Anybody want to take a guess who it might be? Come on. <coughs> Ashley Madison. Now, I haven't used Ashley Madison because I don't know all the details, and I can't point a finger yet. But to me, Ashley Madison is as much of a seminal event as Target is because, it, again, it's changed how we perceive these things. There wasn't identity theft. There wasn't credit card numbers being stolen. It was moral outrage that this site existed that facilitated affairs between presumably married people. From that, now that we can deal with by itself, you can have a long conversation by yourself, but from that we're seeing ransom demands, we've seen suicides attributed to the Ashley Madison data being released, we're seeing public figures being discredited based on the rumor that their name and email address happened to be in Ashley Madison. So it is, a, it is another one that will continue to play out for a number of years to come. So wrapping this up, technology can only go so far. But you do need the technology. And when you're looking at vendors, you should think about a single vendor solution. But only if that single vendor solution can talk the way that I describe, that they close off these gaps through whatever mechanism they choose, but that it's not just a bunch of products from the same company, but don't talk to each other. Your network doesn't stop at your boundary. I'm sure you all have contractors, suppliers, remote employees. That extension needs to be covered as part of your security architecture as well. And your employees, Yes, they are your first line of defense. Equip them with knowledge, give them training, make them understand the scope of the issue that you're dealing with, and leverage the fact that they are there. And more importantly, never assume. Never assume you're fully protected, and certainly never assume that your network is not already breached. I hope I've given you something to think about. If you'd like, we're down on the second floor. My colleagues and myself are in our booth. Be happy to talk about any of this. I want to thank you for your time. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. <laughs>